Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first OHS Insider webinar of 2019. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Our topic is the new CSA Office Ergonomics Standard, What Employers Need to Know. Our speaker is Rachel Mitchell of Ergo, and I'll give a bit of an introduction on Rachel, then I'll be going through a couple quick housekeeping notes just to make sure the webinar runs smoothly, and then we'll jump right into the topic. So Rachel is a Canadian certified professional ergonomist with registered kinesiology with over 15 years experience in both Canada and the United States. She holds a master's of science in human factors engineering from Nottingham University. Rachel has worked for a number of large ergonomic consulting firms and most recently worked to provide return to work coordination for clients attending the WSIB specialty programs. Rachel has successfully assisted clients with extended work absences, those suffering from chronic pain, and those with work-related post-traumatic stress disorder return to meaningful work. Rachel has provided ergonomic expertise to a wide range of environments, including manufacturing, warehousing, healthcare, construction, transportation, public utility, office, childcare, retail, educational, pulp and paper, and food preparation. Her experience includes completing detailed ergonomic analysis, physical demands analysis, office assessments, ergonomic program development and evaluation, return to work assessments, ergonomics integration into engineering designs, energy expenditure analysis, as well as a wide range of training programs, including one hour lunch and learns to three day workshops. So we're very lucky to have Rachel here with us today. And I think it's gonna be a great presentation. I'm your moderator, Morgan Berna, and if you have um, any questions, they will be going to me. So to begin to ask a question, you'll need to click the orange arrow on your GoToWebinar control panel. This will bring up a questions tab where you can simply type your question in and press enter. Please feel free to submit a question at any time. They'll come straight to me. So if you have a technical issue or if you're looking to submit a question for the speaker, it all goes here. And then at the end of the presentation, any questions from Rachel, I'll read out to her and we'll go through them all. If for any reason you lose connection, which hopefully has nothing to do with what's on the screen here, you can give us a call at 1-800-667-9300 and one of our customer service reps will be happy to help you get back online. And finally, for additional resources, we will be recording today's session and we'll also be providing a PDF of the slides a bit later today. So again, look for an email coming from me and that will have all those details for you. If you're an OHS Insider member, the recording will show up in the recorded webinars section. And if you're currently on a trial, you'll be receiving login details. So look for an email for me later that will go over all that. And without further ado, I'm going to switch it over to Rachel and we'll begin. All right. Did I do that right, Morgan? Can you see the full slides? We just need to switch which one. So if you hit uh, display settings, you can switch which one, the screen. Can you switch back to yours and I'll just do it again? Do you mind doing that? For sure me? thing. Thank you. All right, there you go. Perfect. That did it. Perfect. All right, ready to go. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, as Morgan mentioned, my name is Rachel. Uh, I work for Ergo Inc. Uh, we are just getting started on our 25th year of service here. So we are quite excited about that. And uh, this is just kind of one of the things that we're planning to do this year to sort of celebrate the, the milestone. So as we get going here, um, what the plan is today is to, oh, there we go, sorry, I had trouble with my slide, um, is to talk a little bit about this new CSA guideline. I'm gonna take you through the major sections of the guideline, highlighting those sections that have changed most substantially since the original in 2000, as well as identifying kind of any uh, sections that I think are kind of most critical for your ability to 
implement an ergonomics program in your own environment. Um, as we go through each of these sort of major sections, there'll be a little checklist at the end of each section. There are questions for you to ask yourself about your own workplace and maybe to give you some ideas of things that you might want to implement in order to improve the program that you already have. Uh, so we're gonna be talking a bit about kind of ergonomics as part of an entire occupational health and safety system, uh, the acknowledgement of psychosocial hazards now in the new standard, the eternal question of sitting and standing and what we're supposed to do with all of that and everyone's requests for sit stand workstations. Uh, as well as some things on monitors, multiple monitors, alternative input devices, and the acknowledgement of kind of tablets and mobile devices as part of our regular work environments. All right, so the standard is the CSA Z412-17. Um, it is referred to as the application standard for workplace ergonomics, and it is the third edition. Now, it was released in early 2018, although it is dated um, 17. I think it came out in March. So most of us are still sort of getting our feet wet. Um, it is a very long read um, and takes a, a little bit of time to get through. So hopefully I'll uh, be able to shorten most of that for you today and, and focus you in on the sections that are most relevant to you. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the first overhaul of the standard since uh, the year 2000. And if you can remember back that far, uh, you'll, you'll sort of become quite aware of, of how much has really changed since 2000. Um, the technology that we deal with in our offices is so different now. And so it really was about time for us to acknowledge this. I mean, I didn't have a cell phone in, in the year 2000. Um, most people had only a single monitor on their desk and, and that sort of thing. The other major change is that in 2000, this was an ergonomics guideline. And so now it is an ergonomics standard. That change has been done in order to provide this document with more weight um, and in hopes that it will uh, be able to be applied a bit more thoroughly in, in corporate settings. The standard is also designed to be applied to all office users. And so there is an acknowledgement within the document that there are people who work in non-traditional environments, home offices, people who use their laptops and vehicles. And so there is some acknowledgement of some of the challenges and uh, ways that we might go around dealing with some of these, these other environments. So that is new to, to the standard as well. Um, so this is a standard for a comprehensive ergonomics program. Um, so it's really kind of a holistic approach. It takes a look at the entire ergonomics program. It provides some design parameters for office furniture. Um, but for those of you who are interested, the BIFMA standard still remains sort of the main go-to for actual furniture design and equipment. It is a more detailed document than the um, design parameters that, that fall in this as it relates to how high chairs should be and what lumbar support should look like and some of those things. The, the standard is designed to outline mandatory ergonomic requirements. And again, that's related to this change from a guideline to a standard. So the document goes, um, you know, describes demands in terms or uh, necessities in terms of, you know, somebody shall do something rather than somebody should. Again, in order to allow the document, if it were to be adopted by a jurisdiction, to allow sections to be enforceable. It is not legally enforceable as it is now. I don't know any jurisdictions that have adopted it, um, but that is a possibility and something they are hoping for. And if a company were to adopt it, then anything that is a shall, that is a mandatory requirement, sort of becomes a necessity for their corporate due diligence. So it can be used in that way. The other thing that I should mention is that at least in the province of Ontario, where I do the majority of my work, um, the Ministry of Labor has been known to quote the previous CSA um, guideline in terms of best practices when writing orders. And so the expectation is that they would likely continue to do so but in relation to this new document. Um, so it is still a little bit too new. Uh, I haven't personally seen any orders with, with reference to this, but we would expect that that is likely to happen. 
Okay, so let's take a look at kind of this holistic occupational health and safety system. So um, we're looking at office ergonomics as part of a system that you already have in place in your workplace. So rather than it being its own entity, it is designed to be kind of part and rolled into something that's already got some kind of framework, something that's already got top-down support, something that's already got the resources in place to ensure that you can be successful. Because obviously without the manpower, without the financial resources, um, you're going to have difficulty complying with the requirements of the standard. As an ergonomist, uh, one of the things that, that many of us were very happy to see in this new standard is that there is reference to the fact that assessments should be completed by a competent person in ergonomics. Now, the definition of a competent person in ergonomics is a little bit up for debate and I would argue is going to vary with the situation. So depending on the complexity of, of a situation, you may need different individuals capable of doing different types of assessments. So in Canada, the highest level of designation for an ergonomist is uh, the CCPE designation. That's the Canadian Certified Professional Ergonomist um, designation. And within the standards, uh, when there is mention of people working in vehicles, people working with multiple monitors, this specific mention of competence comes up. So again, the acknowledgement that, that some situations are more complicated. So for many of the clients that I work with, they may have somebody internally who maybe takes one of our one day office ergonomics courses. That person then becomes the in-house sort of resource for standard workstation assessments, and then maybe somebody with a higher level of competence is available on an as-needed basis for situations that are more complex. The other thing in this particular standard is that, that we need to make note of is that the standard is designed to ensure that every single person is accommodated, which means that you have to assess each person's individual needs. So, for example, the BIFMA standard for furniture that indicates, you know, that chairs typically need to go, you know, from so many inches to so many inches to, ac to accommodate a range of people's heights. Those are designed only to accommodate usually the fifth percentile female to the 95th percentile male. And so there are very short people and very tall people who fall outside of those kind of general bell curves and outside sort of um, those guidelines. The this particular standard acknowledges the fact that there are going to be those people for whom sort of the, the average sized equipment is maybe not going to fit them and that we need to make sure that every single person is accommodated, even if they fall outside that curve. So that is where this is going to differ a little bit from some of the kind of furniture standards and things that you would see. So many of you may be familiar with this sort of plan, do, check, act process. And because that is a, a process that falls into many of the occupational health and safety systems, it is sort of pulled into this um, in an application to office ergonomics. So the planning section is again, ensuring that those resources and that commitment is in place to allow you to be successful with a program. And the do is really the hands-on ergonomic assessments of workstations, the implementation of changes, control of hazards. The check is an auditing of your program, ensuring the components are in place, um, following up on assessments, and then sort of this continual improvement process. So again, for, for the folks who, you know, uh, are maybe management level and, and they understand this piece, then we can try to use their language in order to help with the building of our ergonomics program. So some questions for you to ask yourself in terms of your particular work environment. So the first is, do you have an ergonomics program in place? If the answer is no, and you, the idea of creating an ergonomics uh, policy feels a little bit daunting. I'm going to give you a tip here. So some of you may be familiar with the MSD prevention series uh, program. It's the picture of the little blue book in the bottom right hand corner of the slide. These are the old um, MSD prevention program. They're the PDF hard copies. There are copies of an ergonomics policy within the toolbox section of that document. And so you can actually pull that, make changes to it and adopt it as your own policy if you don't wanna create something from scratch. You can still download um, these prevention program documents. They are in the midst now of redoing the prevention, Ontario Prevention Program onto a web-based, but not all of the materials have moved over yet. So 
the best place to find some of these things is still in the original kind of PDF documents. You can also access them through our website. So if you have any trouble finding them, let me know. Um, the next question is, do you have some kind of formal procedure to allow people to request an ergonomics assessment? So if somebody is having difficulty, do they know how to go about asking for help? And then do you have an appropriate person who can do an assessment in-house, out-of-house, whatever the case may be? Do you have some kind of process that allows ergonomics to be considered when you are designing new workstations stations, or purchasing equipment? So oftentimes the person who sits in the purchasing department who buys chairs may not know very much about what makes for a proper office chair that is going to fit everyone and rather decisions may be made more on cost and aesthetics. And so we can do a disservice and end up ordering a whole lot of chairs that do not work for our tallest people or our shortest piece people, or there may be issues. So we need to ensure that we close that piece of the loop as well. And then do you have a method to train people on their, their equipment or on their chair? Um, so we do a disservice if we provide people with equipment and we don't teach people to use it. And so many of us may think, well, a chair seems really straightforward and people shouldn't need training on a chair, but I would challenge you all to look at what you're sitting on right now. Do you know what every single knob on your chair does? Odds are you probably know what about 75% of them do, and there may be one or two knobs that you're not exactly sure what they do. Um, if there are knobs on your chair and you don't know what they do yet, and you're sitting in that seat 40 hours a week, odds are you probably could get a better fit if you knew what those last couple of adjustments were. And so I think it's important that we provide that piece of training. I spend a surprising amount of my time teaching people how to use equipment that they already have, but have not made full use of yet. And then the last piece is if you feel like you've already got an ergonomics program in place and you think it's working well and you'd like to take a step back as we kind of come into the new year and audit your program, the MSD prevention program also has an auditing tool in it, little checklist you can go through and kind of see where some of your shortfalls might be. Okay, so the next section is uh, related to kind of this do part of our plan do check act. It's the acknowledge or the, um, identification of hazards in the workplace. And up until now, that focus has really been on physical hazards. So environmental risks in a, in a workstation, musculoskeletal risks in a workstation. And only in the last year or so, I would say, we have um, started to do a much better job at acknowledging that there are cognitive, that there are mental health, um, challenges that people are facing in workplaces and that there are these psychosocial hazards related to how work is designed and how work is organized that um, can present challenges to, to the folks in the workplace. And so some of those hazards might be people who have unclear work expectations, people whose jobs have really high psychological demands, people with little control over their work um, in terms of either the autonomy or the volume of work that they are responsible for, um, environments where there is a lack of employee participation or engagement, lack of protection for the workers. And what we know about these psychosocial factors is it's not just about how they affect people's mental health, but that we know that they can either um, increase the risk of onset of a musculoskeletal disorder or aggravate an existing musculoskeletal disorder. And I would add to that that if you are dealing with any kind of return to work issue, these become even more important in terms of how they affect people's success levels in returning to the workplace when there are psychosocial uh, factors that are already in place. And so I think the standard has done such a great job at, at acknowledging these things in writing as we um, really are starting to promote more kind of mental health um, in, in our workplaces. So some things for you to consider about your own work environment, your own workplace, is uh, do you feel you're providing staff with clear expectations and responsibilities? Are people getting timely and clear feedback? Do people have opportunities to build their skills, advance themselves in a workplace, participate um, in some way? Um, do people have autonomy, uh, autonomy and work flexibility? Is there a process for people to uh, voice their concerns? Do you have a process in place to manage 
cognitive or mental health limitations. So we may have return to work plans in place for physical impairments. We may not have return to work plans in place yet or processes in place yet for dealing with a cognitive deficit or a mental health issue. Is there employee assistance program in place? And have you considered or have you started conducting CDAs, cognitive demands assessments on any of your you know, mentally demanding um, or psychologically demanding jobs. And so, um, you know, this has really come up, I would say, in the last six months or so that clients are now starting to focus on creating a library of cognitive demands assessments for those jobs that they feel have the highest levels of risk. And uh, I actually taught a cognitive demands uh, assessment course. Uh, we ran it for the first time last fall with great success um, because there's been so much interest and so much um, uh, concern about how we are going to be managing these things in our workplace moving forward. So I expect that this will continue to be kind of an area of interest and focus for folks. Okay, so the next section um, within the standard is a much larger acknowledgement of the need for variable working postures. So the last version of the, when it was a guideline, really relied on what we would, would call now traditional sitting. So what you see in the photo, you know, 90 degrees at the hips, 90 degrees at the, at the knees. Um, and so that was really sort of the seated posture that we were expecting everyone to be able to get into in their workplace. And what we're acknowledging now with the new standard is that the need for movement through a range and variety of postures is important and that more than one posture may be appropriate for an individual. So the postures that are in the standard are not all necessarily different than what was in it before, um, just that there is much more focus on kind of the need for the variability. So, um, kind of pulled over from the older versions, again, the traditional sitting, but also a partially reclined, i.e. having the backrest angled backwards a little bit, um, the traditional upright seated posture, a forward tilted posture, um, and a brand new to the standard now is semi-standing, um, which is probably best described as sort of being on a stool and slightly perched forward on the edge of a stool. So it's halfway between sitting and standing. So that is a, a brand new kind of acknowledged um, acceptable posture as well as full standing um, in, in the standard right now. And so, you know, this focus on variable postures is probably not surprising to anybody. We have all seen over the last year a range of sort of media interest and, and newsletter articles and newspaper articles on, you know, what is perceived as a potential risk from prolonged sitting and a desire in our staff to get out of kind of traditional sitting postures. So I, I just wanna take a minute and sort of talk about where some of this uh, research started that, that got this, you know, maybe sitting is killing us all concern that, that people are sort of bringing forward to the workplace. I mean, I've seen um, some headlines as severe as, you know, sitting is the new smoking. And, and I really don't think issues are, are nearly as, um, you know, it, it's not nearly as sort of as severe as, it, as it's being, out, being made out to be. Um, so basically where some of this um, concern with sitting came from is there were a number of re um, research papers that have been put out. I'm just gonna give you a sample of a couple of them. So the first is a study of 4,000 people over a three year um, period of time. And what that study found was that there were health issues with prolonged sitting. People were more likely to have uh, you know, larger waist, waistline, uh, higher cholesterol levels, higher BMIs, and that it, there, is, there was a risk of premature mortality associated with prolonged sitting. There was then a second study with over 200,000 people that were followed for almost five years. 
Um, and it found similar results. So prolonged sitting was a risk factor for mortality. So this is where the headlines, you know, sitting is killing you are, are coming from. And what it found, which was really concerning, was that sitting was an independent risk factor regardless of how much physical activity you did. Um, so, so it didn't matter if you sat for 10 hours, whether or not you went to the gym afterwards or not. Um, so, so that's really kind of the, the starting place for it. But, but what's really important to note is that these studies are about lifestyle and about the sitting that you do kind of in a totality over the course of a week or, or years of your life. And so they are not a comment specifically on sitting that happens at work. And so there were some studies done kind of subsequent to these, this first sort of set that looked at, um, what sitting looks like if you are if you sort of control for the amount of sitting that people do at work. So two different studies, one 70,000 people, one um, 12,000 people, so still fairly large size studies. And what they found was that there was an increased um, cardiovascular risk if people sat more than 10 hours a day. But when they controlled for occupational sitting time, the amount of time you spent sitting at work was not a factor here. So the risk is coming from what what people are doing outside of their seated hours at work. Um, and so it is important to keep in mind that it is not the sitting at work really that's the issue. It's sort of the lifestyle in in general that we look at. That being said, we are still acknowledging that that prolonged sitting does have some risks and we still want to encourage these sort of variable postures and movement throughout the day. Um, but we keep these in mind in order to kind of moderate some of the concern that people have about whether sitting is really that harmful for them when they're at work. So let's come back to what the guideline or what the standard um, specifically says with respect to sitting. So it says that the, the chair has to fit the user, meaning the chair has to be adjustable um, and that you may need to have multiple versions of a chair for those that are bigger, smaller, taller, shorter, so on and so forth. The chair has to allow someone to get into one of these reference postures. So this upright sitting, this reclined sitting, semi-standing, any of those postures, you have to be able to get it. You don't have to be able to get into all of them, but you have to be able to get into a proper reference posture in the chair for the chair to be deemed sort of appropriate. The suggestion is that people be able to get into these postures without the use of a footrest. And so if you are under six foot tall, then the, your ability to get into that posture without a footrest really means that you have to have either height adjustable desks or you have to have keyboard trays uh, available um, because most people's seated elbow height is going to be at least a couple of inches lower than the 29 inches that are a standard desk. That's really elbow height for a you know, fairly tall um, male. So, you know, that that is sort of endorsing the use of a keyboard tray over having people sitting high and being on a footrest. And it's again, because a footrest really limits the amount of postures that somebody can move through because you end up with a fairly small square that your feet have to be on all of the time. Whereas if you sit lower and your feet are on the floor, you have the ability to stretch your legs out and to change postures a little bit more fluidly over the course of the day. The recommended range for desk height is 22.6 to 29.4 inches. If desks are fixed, they should not be taller than 29.4 inches. Uh, keep in mind, they are still making desks out there that are 30 and 30 and a half inches, so beware of those. Um, chairs should be able to lock in multiple positions and should have some sort of adjustable lumbar support. The other phrasing that, that I want to point out to you is within the standard, it indicates that seating must provide stable body support. And when I read this, this was the sentence that I immediately kind of copied out and, and pulled for a number of my clients, because if you take a moment and think about what would not qualify as stable body support, hopefully you have come up with a ball chair in your minds. Um, because a ball chair would not meet the criteria for stable body support. I'm not going to get into ball chairs in, in great detail here, but I do have a number of clients um, who, for good reason, have concerns with people's continued use of ball chairs. And so if you are looking for some support to discourage their use or minimize their use, then there is this phrasing within the standard um, about stable body support. By the same token, a treadmill desk probably would not meet the criteria either. 
Okay, so the question is, how long should people actually sit? Now, this is not in the standard. I've pulled the section from some research, but it sort of felt relevant with the conversation we're having for me to, to sort of pass some of this along to you as well. So the question about how long you should sit really depends. It depends on what kind of seat you're on, what kind of posture you're in, what kind of work you're doing. If for some reason you sit on a stool, you don't have a backrest because of the nature of work, then obviously, Sitting, you know, has to be more variable and people have to be able to get out of seated postures more often. But generally speaking, the recommendation is 60 minutes maximum at a time, because the longer you sit, the more compressive force you get down through the spine. And prolonged sitting has generally been defined as um, anything over six hours a day. So we're sort of trying to promote to, to clients that you know, you should try to get into your chair at least every hour and to find ways to move around, to incorporate more movement, to go and talk to somebody rather than sending them an email um, in order to allow you to get into your chair more often so that hopefully you are spending less than six hours a day total sitting. Um, again, any opportunities we have to get up, we do want to make sure that we are promoting those. When we look at a standing workstation, the, the standard itself indicates that standing workstations are appropriate for anyone who has to lift more than four and a half kgs, so that's 10 pounds. Um, basically, the acknowledgement that um, lifting while sitting is not a great idea, and that standing desks should adjust from 38.3 to 48.7 inches. I would just warn you to make sure that you are keeping tabs on this sort of recommended top range for desks with all of the interest now in standing desks and sit stand desks. There are more and more companies getting in the market selling um, products that meet kind of meet these needs. And as a way to stay competitive and to keep their costs down, what we are noticing is that many of the units that are ending up in our clients' facilities do not have substantial range in order to accommodate the tallest, the tallest folks. And sometimes that even means somebody who's over 5'9 or 5'10. Um, so we're getting units that max out at, you know, at 43 inches or 42 inches rather than all the way up to 48 or 49 inches high. So make sure if you are ordering something that you are getting enough range to accommodate all of your staff. The standing desk also has to allow people to, to attain, again, this reference posture for standing. And this is a photo of what it looks like. Again, it's an upright position, vertical, elbows bent at 90, monitors at eye level, um, with the option to periodically raise one foot up on some kind of step stool or rail or something like that, again, to allow some ranges in posture while, while you are working. So uh, as we sort of sum up the, this variable posture section, things for you to consider for your own workplace is, do you have the equipment that you need in order to allow somebody to get into a reference posture? Right, so from the photo of the ball chair, I've done my best to kind of draw some lines through the main joint centers. So you can see that the legs are not, you know, there is not 90 degrees, the knees are too high, you know, the elbows are not directly underneath the shoulders. So not only is the ball not a stable body support, but it also has not allowed for the, for the reference posture because the knees are too high and the elbows are too far forward and too high relative um, to the body because the elbows should be kind of directly underneath that shoulder joint line. Do you have multiple styles of chair available? Do you have chairs available in a petite, in a large? Um, if you are purchasing chairs, the best feature to buy to minimize the need for different size chairs is something with a seat pan slider. A seat pan slider provides adjustable depth to the seat of a chair allows you to make a chair short for somebody with short legs and much deeper for somebody with long legs. That will accommodate most of your individuals, but you may still need a resource for petite chairs for people who are very small and potentially a larger chair for somebody who needs either a wider or taller seat. Um, do you have ball chairs in your office that, that maybe you need to take a second look at and are your staff trained on their equipment? So do they know how to adjust things to the right height? When you start giving people sit-stand desks and adjustability, then 
you know, if they're adjusting between sitting and standing every hour, then there is the potential that they get the height wrong every hour when they adjust it, unless they know exactly what they are, you know, trying to achieve. Do they know how often they should be, you know, changing postures? Do they know the importance of movement, how to use all of the controls and what the potential health risks are of the decisions that they are making? Um, so I will also leave you with this. This is again outside the standard, um, but these are the recommendations that we're generally providing to people. So sitting 30 to 60 minutes, no more than six hours total a day. Standing less than 20 minutes at a time. For most people, standing will create low back pain faster than sitting does. Um, so for most people, kind of pain and discomfort will start at that 30 or 40 minute mark. So we want people out of standing, you know, before they hit that. The goal is to change posture before you're uncomfortable. If you wait until you experience discomfort, you've waited too long. And generally standing is recommended for less than four hours a day. Statistically speaking, you're more likely to have back pain if you stand more than four hours a day. And that is, again, standing in one position in front of a computer, not jobs with you know a whole lot of walking and that sort of thing. So usually we have somebody with a sit stand desk start with a goal of, you know, a total of an hour a day of standing and then work their way up from there. I think a lot of times when these standing desks start to gather dust, it's because someone has done too much too soon and uh, had some discomfort and then sort of abandoned ship. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next section. We're gonna deal with some of the uh, equipment that um, is acknowledged in the standard and what it has to say about the equipment. So the recommendation in the standard is that monitors be positioned between eye level and 60 degrees below eye level and within 35 degrees on either side of the midline. So as I mentioned, you know, back in 2000, when this originally came out, people had one monitor, the monitor was huge and it took up your whole desk. Now we've got people who started with one monitor and then went to two. And for those of us who've gone to two, we all feel like we could never go back to one because two is so much better than one. And the problem is, is it's a slippery slope where people then think, well, three has gotta be better than two. Um, but when you start getting into three screens, those peripheral vision requirements are so significant that it becomes almost impossible to kind of keep everything within that 35 degrees to either side of the midline. And so people start reporting neck issues from the head twisting that happens when they go to three screens. Um, the standards recommend a competent person in order to assess anyone who was, who was working with more than two monitors in order to deal with kind of the challenges associated with that. And uh, many of you will have seen sort of research and over the last little while about blue light and kind of night shift functions running with an iPhone. You may have noticed your phone has this, you know, new night shift function where after a certain time of night, you can have it kind of automatically shift. Um, the same thing exists on tablets and even on, on computer monitors where you can adjust the screen. So basically what happens when you set a night shift is the screen changes from kind of a cooler blue to kind of a bit of a warmer orangey brown hue that has less blue wavelength light. And the idea is that the blue wavelength light is potentially disruptive to circadian rhythms. So people who work at night or those of us guilty of doing stuff on, on our phones or tablets while we're in bed right before we try to go to sleep, that that can be really disruptive. And so the encouragement for, for people who are working in late evening hours or overnight in order to try to use um, those functions that are available on a monitor. Okay, so with respect to your workplace, um, do you have some way to gatekeep, to force people through a consultation or a check-in with someone before they simply order themselves, uh, you know, a third or fourth or however many more monitors? And are you ensuring that people have the education on kind of where, where to put monitors? Again, we sort of assume people know how to do this, um, but based on experience, I would say that people do, do struggle a little bit with kind of where the right place to put their monitors are. You know, are they left eye dominant? Are they right eye dominant? And kind of making the right choices with respect to that. 
The other is um, that there is some acknowledgement that, um, you know, we have an aging population, we have more people who are wearing progressive lenses, and there are a whole lot of additional challenges that go along with progressive lens use. So, um, you know, most of us are familiar with the posture that you will see with somebody who's using a bifocal or a progressive lens where they're using that bottom section of the lens to see the, the screen. So often the chin kind of comes up towards the ceiling because people are looking out through the bottom of the lens. And so there's a need to get screens so much lower when people are using progressive or bifocal lenses. And I am finding increasingly that where people are struggling with their progressives, that we are recommending that people consider switching over to a computer lens i.e. Um, you know a single lens that is set for the sort of office distance that people are typically working at that allows them to have a single prescription that fills the entire lens that they can use for computer work just because some people are really having difficulty kind of getting around their their progressive lenses um, with respect to input devices, there isn't a, a ton of kind of new information um, there. Again, the, the sort of continued reference to, you know, your input devices must allow you to get into a seated reference posture, meaning that your mouse can't be so far out to the side or to the back of the, the, the desk that you're forward reaching, um, because that would not qualify then as a reference posture. The only specific equipment that is mentioned is that there is specific mention of keyboards with no number pad for right-handed mouse users. Um, and this is because uh, if you look at a, a keyboard that you might have in front of you now, if you've got a full-size keyboard, when the mouse is positioned on the right-hand side beyond a number pad, the lateral reach to the mouse is increased. And anyone who's a little narrower through the shoulders, that kind of reaching to the right can create some shoulder issues. So getting rid of a number pad if people don't need it or having a number pad over on the left does allow the mouse to kind of scoot in a little closer to the side of the body, gets us closer to this sort of reference posture. Um, there are There is sort of general mention, you know, of split keyboards and tented keyboards that could be appropriate for carpal tunnel syndrome or epicondylitis, but nothing kind of sp more specific with, relate, with uh, relation to that, only that we need to assess kind of each person's needs independently. With respect to the mouse, um, you know, I was thrilled to see that um, left-handed mousing is, is highly encouraged in here. It's something, you know, that I have been encouraging clients to do for the last, you know, 17 years or so that I've been practicing. And that is, again, for the same reason as, you know, going to a keyboard without a number pad. And that is that when you put the mouse on the left, you don't have to contend with reaching past a number pad. So it does increase the or decrease the lateral reach to the mouse. And also for those who are right-handed, I would argue that most people who are right-handed are you know, heavily reliant on the right side, tend to um, place all demands on the right side, and then as a result can overload um, that side kind of over a career. Whereas I think that lefties are often a bit better at sharing tasks across the two hands um, and distributing workload better. And I don't say that only because I'm a lefty. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a good strategy to kind of help people move forward with um, better sh sharing workloads kind of across the body. And there is also some reference to palm rests, which some of you will um, be familiar with kind of as gel wrist rests or that sort of thing. Um, Gel wrist rests are often kind of the first line of defense when somebody has discomfort, they open the Staples catalog and order the first quote unquote ergonomic gel wrist rest they can find in the, in the catalog, often without a lot of sort of beneficial impact. Um, this kind of equipment is often a Band-Aid, it doesn't solve the root problem and can in cases make things worse. And so there is mention in the standard that their usefulness really does need to be assessed on an individual basis, that we have to make sure the, this equipment is not creating wrist extension, is not forcing people to plant their wrists in place with increased pressure then through the carpal tunnel and sort of a tendency to stretch the fingers rather than letting the hands kind of float across the keyboard as we, as we type. 
Uh, so if you consider the environment that you're working in now, do employees have the ability to um, request alternative input devices if they need them? Um, do you have a way to, to provide um, an assessment to make sure people are getting the right equipment? Again, the instinct is sometimes to order a keyboard labeled ergonomic without understanding whether or not that particular design is the right match for someone's specific needs. Um, and if you walk through your work uh, environment, do you find people using travel-sized mice? Because travel-sized mice are designed for travel and are really too small to be used in most circumstances for regular kind of office work. Are the people who have the biggest hands, do they have larger sized mice, again, to make sure that we are working with things that are the right size? And how many people do you see around using, you know, gel wrist rest? Because that's a flag that people are suffering from discomfort and maybe we need to acknowledge that in some way. Okay, the last major section in here to acknowledge is the mo mobile equipment, which is obviously entirely new since the 2000 um, guideline came out. And some of this may feel initially a bit um, shocking. So the recommendation in the standard is that mobile equipment be limited to short durations only. Now they don't put a number on short durations, but they do reference a study um, by Richard Wells that indicates that tablet use should be limited to less than 10 minutes at a time. So I would challenge you all for the next week or so to try to put your phone down every time you hit 10 minutes. Um, I think it would be incredibly challenging to do so for many of us, um, but I think it's an interesting sort of thing to consider. And the reason for putting such short time limits on this is because of the head position and the arm position that result, result from this kind of mobile um, equipment use. So, you know, the human head weighs 12 or 14 pounds. You know, as soon as you take the head 30 degrees forward, the head is now the equivalent of a 40 pound bowling ball kind of resting on your neck. And if your head's as far forward as 45 degrees, the load on the neck is 50 pounds. Um, so, you know, this has the potential to create a lot of neck issues for people. And in addition to that, then your arm is raised up in the air while you're holding your equipment. You know, it's basically a trade off between the neck and the shoulder. The more the head is down is, you know, makes the shoulder easy. But if you're trying to keep your head nice and neutral, then your arms got to come up a lot higher in the air and that overloads the shoulder. Um, the exception here is if you can use your mobile device in a quote unquote reference posture, then you don't um, need to be taking the same number of breaks and rest from your mobile equipment. Um, with respect to the way in which people are doing um, uh, data entry into these devices. There is a recommendation for external keyboards, for things like tablets, for styluses um, rather than finger tapping for, for entry. And that if people are using their fingers um, to type, then you are alternating between the fingers and the thumb with the fingers doing more of the work. And when the thumb is used, that is the thumb pad rather than the tip of the thumb because using the tip of the thumb creates a more substantial um, bend in the, the fingers, encouraging people to use both hands and really watching that kind of static holding, that static grip on the, the piece of equipment while we are holding it. And as much as most of us don't like predictive, uh, predictive text and all the strange things it sometimes tries to say, um, using abbreviations and predictive text obviously have some advantage for kind of minimizing de demands as it relates to this. I mean, some of you may be familiar, but over the last couple of years, even, you know, we've started to rename some of our ailments with relation to our mobile technology. So, you know, tendonitis of the thumb is often referred to now as Blackberry thumb. And so, you know, it is clear that we all recognize that there is a connection between this new technology that we are seeing more and more use of in the workplace and the struggles that people are having sort of with musculoskeletal disorders. I and mean, people who commute to work could spend hours you know, answering emails and, and doing this sort of typing, um, you know, on a, on a train on the way home. 
Um, there, there are some specific thing, things mentioned in terms of laptops, and I think this is a really important takeaway message for us, and that is that it that laptops are not designed to be used for extended periods of time, and if they are, there has to be at the very least an external keyboard and an external mouse in place and either a secondary monitor or just the laptop put up on top of a you know stack of copy paper or a riser in order to place the monitor at the correct height. Laptops are designed to be laptops only in transit. So in conference rooms, on the road, when you're traveling, they are not des designed to be used as a laptop in a workstation for 40 hours a week. Um, they should be docked and um, set up like a desktop computer um, with the external keyboard and the mouse for any kind of regular use. Um, and I think this is something we've we've maybe not done a great job of ensuring people have the right equipment when they are provided with with laptops. So if you think about the, the workplace you are in, do your staff have external keyboards and mice? for their laptops and tablets? And are people really encouraged to use them? Do people understand you know, what the risks are if you use a laptop as a laptop? The screen is so low on a laptop when you are typing on that keyboard that it really has the potential to create, if you think again about that weight of the head and what it does when the head starts to come forward, then, then that can really be a challenge. And do you have a workplace that's you know, discouraging people from using their phones and tablets regularly? Or do you have staff who are sort of expected to be answering emails at all hours of the day um, on their cell phones, which goes both to the sort of risks associated with the mobile use, but also some of those psychosocial factors that we have to acknowledge in the workplace as well. Now, the last thing that I will leave you with are um, some tips um, that we would provide people with in order to incorporate this sort of importance of movement and variability through the day. So I mentioned earlier, you know, we really want to encourage people to get up and go talk to a colleague rather than sending them an email. We have clients now who are incorporating standing meeting spaces. So they might have, you know, cocktail height tables or um, for stand up meetings, which then uh, research suggests are much faster and more efficient meetings. Um, I like to encourage my clients to stand up when they answer the phone, assuming that they're not a call center operator who's doing that all day long. But for many of us, you know, if the phone rings and we stand up, it's a good way to kind of break that habit of sitting. Oftentimes people are asking us questions that we can answer while we're in standing. We don't have to look something up on the computer. And so it's gotten us up and out of our chair. Um, some clients are going to um, sign up workstations for sit-stand desks or kind of some of these more novel workspaces. So instead of everyone having sit-stand desks, there's maybe five sign up workstations and people can go and work at one of those workstations for half a day or for a day in order to really get a better sense of, you know, who's really going to use these long term and, you know, which people are interested in a standing desk as kind of the novelty and then discover over time that maybe it's not their preferred method of of working. So lots of things to consider, you know, even our mobile devices, while they can present all of these challenges for us, there are lots of apps that remind you to get out of your chair and remind you to stretch and remind you to move around. And so we can have some of those things maybe working to our advantage as well. So that's about all that I wanted to cover related to this standard. I'm happy to do my best to um, answer any questions that have come up. So maybe I will pass things along to Morgan in just a second so she can start collecting and letting me know what your questions might be. I'm also gonna throw this up on the screen from na for now. So uh, our email address is on the bottom of the page here and our website. So if you're looking for some of the resources, the musculus, or the MSD prevention program um, in order to download that or information on courses or articles on ball chairs and things like that, you can find all of those um, things at our website. All right, Morgan, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And just as a reminder for everyone, I got a few questions. We are recording today's session, so that's going to be sent around an email coming from me a bit later today. And as well, Rachel's provided a PDF of her slides, so I'll be sending that around as well. 
Okay, we've had quite a few questions come in so far. As a quick reminder to anyone, you might need to click the orange arrow to expand your GoToWebinar control panel. From there, you should see a questions tab where you can simply type your question in and press enter. We're gonna see how many of these we can get through in the next about 15 minutes here. And then if there's any follow-up, I encourage you to reach out to Rachel with her info on the screen. I'll send that around as well. All right, so let's dive right in. So the first one is from the beginning of your presentation when you were talking about chairs. And this person asks, how do you find out how to use all the parts of chairs to be able to train people when the chairs are no longer coming with booklets and this person isn't able to find um, a booklet online? All right, so this is an easy one for the most part. And the answer is YouTube. <laughs> Um, you would be surprised that for almost every chair out there, you can probably find a YouTube video of somebody adjusting it. You might need to go through a couple, ideally try to find the manufacturer's um, YouTube video. But if you can find the YouTube video for the chair, then I would encourage you to put it up on your intranet or send it out to your staff as a kind of email wellness initiative because uh, it's not a whole lot of effort on your part, but then really provides people with kind of the information that they need. There are also some manufacturers for whom, you know, they don't they don't change much year to year in kind of how the chair works, even though the chair may look a little bit different. So if you can't find the one for exactly the same chair that you currently have, then you may be able to find at least a similar chair where the knobs do the same thing and the knobs are in the same places just because it's the same manufacturer. They're, they're pretty fairly standard in terms of kind of where knobs are and what each knob does on most kind of standard chairs. So I would encourage you to try that. And then as you're buying new chairs in the future, make sure you get those videos because they really do exist for, for any new chair and then save it somewhere so that you'll have it, you know, five years from now when, um, when somebody has a question about that chair and those booklets have all disappeared. Great, thank you very much. Um, our next question is, in which industry or industries did you perform the cognitive demands analysis you talked about? So we have been doing um, CDAs in, for a number of our clients. Um, I've done quite a few in um, hospitals in the last um, six months or so um, because of kind of the cognitive demands associated with that. Um, also for even office jobs, typically like higher level um, administrators and executives that maybe have higher um, stress and uh, workload demands for some of the, those jobs. But even in the manufacturing sectors, you know, we have, um, when we do PDAs, there will be cognitive sections. And depending on a client's needs they may be fairly short cognitive sections because the jobs really are more physical than cognitive but sometimes those get expanded um, depending on the the needs of a, of a client great thank you our next question is a point of clarification so this person wrote to be clear on the last point about occupational sitting would you be sitting for 10 hours outside of your occupational time for the risk calculation the 10 hours is total sitting time. So, so when you take a look at those studies, the very first thing that they assessed was that anyone who sat more than 10 hours a day was more likely to, um, to be at increased risk. But then when they, they kind of dissolved, disseminated down um, that data further than what they discovered was that that when they looked at that and sort of controlled for how long people were sitting at work, it's not the work part of that 10 hours, but it is a 10 hours total per day. Great, thank you. Um, so this person writes, I have a touch laptop at home and in the near future, I foresee touch monitors. Use of the mouse will decline. Is there a consideration for this new style of input device? Yeah, I mean, I have a touch lap laptop as well. I barely use it um, because it really does not allow for the promotion of these reference postures. So, um, you know, touch laptops and, and touch tablets, I think, are really designed, again, for kind of short entry. You know, we see people using them, you know, in, in sort of... Um, 
some medical environments where like you might be having, you know, filling out a form or a, a survey or a questionnaire with somebody on something together that is touch screen. But then the expectation would be that when you go back to your desk and you're doing kind of your regular type work, that you go back to regular external keyboard and external mouse. And the reason for that is that if you have a touch screen monitor positioned appropriately at with the top of the screen level with your eyes, you have to lift your arm quite high and reach it out in front of you in order to enter data onto the touch screen. So that really adds to the loading of the shoulder. And if to compensate for that, you pull your screen down low and in front of you and a little bit more horizontally in order to make your arm more comfortable, then the whole head comes forward. Um, so the recommendation for any kind of touchscreen tablet or touch time screen um, laptop, again, is going to be short use and then external devices for regular input throughout the day and not kind of continued use of that touch screen. Great, thank you. So this question is about what is considered reference posture for shoulders. So their scenario is um, they understand we'd like to have our forearms supported by armrests and to work with the keyboard close to your body and not in an extended position. However, armrests are typically much wider than standard keyboard sizes. Therefore, is internal ro shoulder rotation considered as a component of reference posture or would it be better to promote a shoulder without internal or external rotation deviations? Okay, so I would argue that an armrest is not a necessity and that reference posture for the shoulder is not necessarily about support of the forearm, rather it's about the position of the elbow relative to the shoulder. So when the elbow is directly underneath the shoulder joint, there is no moment on the shoulder, i.e. the upper arm is hanging vertically without load. Um, and so the kind of non-neutral posture for the shoulder is either the elbow flared out in some kind of abduction because that's gonna load the shoulder joint or the, the elbow forward into shoulder flexion, which will also load the shoulder joint. So I would agree, anyone who is kind of average to small statured is not going to actually use their armrests while they're typing. So if you observe somebody while they're typing, they may use the armrests while they're talking to somebody, while they're on the phone, when they get in and out of the chair, but the elbows are gonna come inside the armrests as soon as they start doing regular typing unless they are very broad shouldered. And I would argue that that is still a reference posture that is still appropriate. So long as the keyboard and mouse are at elbow height, so that some, the forearms remain level and there is still no load on the shoulder joint. Hopefully that makes sense. It's hard to do without pointing and waving at my own arms. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I've had a couple of people ask if this new CSA standard is available for download. It is available for download for, I'm going to say, about $200. To be, I, I apologize. I should have looked up what the cost was before we did this, um, but it is a, it's a few hundred dollars. It is very long, and it's uh, not the easiest document to get through. So unless you feel like you're going to be doing a ton of this, um, and you actually need the document, I, I would hope that you have most of what you need from the slides. Um, but absolutely, you can still you can still buy it. It's through the CSA's uh, website. The C, there's like, I think it's called the CSA store or something has it. If anyone has trouble finding it, send me an email and I'll send you a link. Great, thank you. Uh, so this question is a little bit longer, but I'll try to kind of boil it down here. So they have, it's a company of about 1,300 people and they'll bring in um, ergonomists to do assessments and they're saying they frequently are kind of assessed to change to a sit-stand workstation. However, with sort of the cost that would be involved of that, how should employers deal with providers who continue to recommend sit-stand when there might be other measures that could be successful? Okay. So um, you're going to get people of different uh, of different minds, I guess. I would never argue that a sit stand isn't a, isn't a nice idea. If you can afford to give everybody sit stands, then sit stands are great. And in fact, the reason I like sit stand desks has nothing to do with standing. 
I like sit stand desks because you can set a desk at tw uh, 27 inches instead of 29. And so it makes for a, an improved seated posture for people who are shorter. Um, that being said, I think it's really important to ensure that your providers are uh, distinguishing from I would like a sit stand desk and somebody who needs a sit stand desk. So you can ask them to make that um, that very clear when they make recommendations. Um, because like I said, they're never a bad idea for most people, you know, 98% of the time, they're never gonna be a bad idea. So it's very easy to recommend them for everyone. But I think it's important that we pull out the people for whom they are actually going to be beneficial. So, you know, my neck hurts is, is to me not a reason for a sit stand because sitting or standing shouldn't significantly affect the neck posture. It's more about how things are positioned on the desk. So when I indicate to one of my clients that a sit stand desk is required, then I am usually doing that for medical reasons. So I am trying to pull out the people for whom have long standing low back pain. So this is not somebody whose back started hurting a month ago. This is somebody who, you know, had a car accident six years ago, you know, you know, fell on the ice, you know, a couple of years ago, someone who's always had low back issues, we don't anticipate those low back issues are going to disappear anytime soon. And those people can clearly tell you, you know, when they fly, they have to get up all of the time, or they do better when they're standing, they're more comfortable. Those are the people for whom there's a medical reason for sit stand. And so those are the people that's where we start. And then for the other people who just want to use them, you can have trials, um, you know, where people can, again, sign them out, figure out who's actually going to use them long term before you just start handing them out, because it, it, it is a lot to take on. Great. Thank you very much. Our next question is, if you're using two monitors, would you recommend having a primary and secondary monitor or having two equal monitors? So when you have multiple monitors, the first question you have to ask the person using it is what percentage they use each screen. So if somebody is using the two screens close to 50 50, um, then when you set the monitor up, you line up the middle joint of the two monitors with the middle of the body so that one monitor is slightly left and one monitor is slightly right. They are as close together as they can be and kind of angled in a little bit. Um, many people, though, will tell you that they use one of the monitors 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the time and they just have their email up or a reference document up on that secondary screen. We would refer to that as a as a primary and secondary monitor. And if that is how people are using it, then the primary monitor gets centered as if it was the only screen that they ever use. And the extra monitor goes on whichever side is their dominant eye. And you can Google how to check what somebody's dominant eye is. It'll take me too long to explain it uh, or send me a note and I'll send you an explanation. Um, but it goes on their dominant eye side because they can see it more clearly without rotating the head. So the, the distinction in terms of monitors is really about asking the user the question about how they use their screens. Great, thank you. This person asks, how do you see working with Z412-17 and Z1004-12 at the same time? Do you use them independently or do they complement each other? So I think is 1004, someone's going to have to clarify whoever asked the question in the chat box and maybe we come back to it. But I think that's mm -hmm. the psychological uh, guideline. I don't know them all by number. So if someone can clarify, then maybe we can loop back to that one. Okay, so for the person who wrote in that question, if you could just write in a clarification there, we will answer that. So we'll move on. Um, where are cognitive demand assessment certifications offered? Do you know? Um, so this, I mean, certification is, is kind of the tricky word here, right? Um, so, there isn't going to be anything that's going to be, you know, like a nationally recognized certification, very much like PDAs. There is no um, nationally recognized certification for these. It's there are ind individual consulting companies that are going to be running courses on how to do a PDA or how to do a CDA or how to do an office assessment. And so they are all going to be some sort of certificate um workshop that would allow you to you know put on your resume that you've done this certificate um but are not going to make you kind of quote unquote 
certified to do them. Again, that's sort of the Canadian designation and it's about work experience rather than um, um, having, you know, taken a specific um, course related related to those. Um, I don't know if that that answers the question. Um, so, I mean, we we offer our company does do a CDA workshop. It runs in Ontario twice a year. Um, we do PDA workshops, but any of the large consulting companies across the country will have similar things. I don't know of any, you know, colleges or anything that would have a higher level course kind of specific to doing CDAs. Okay, if that, thank if that you. person has other questions about taking a CDA course, tell them to email me and and uh, and we can have a further chat. Perfect. Okay, so we've got a few more here. Do you have about five more minutes here, Rachel? We could go yeah, through I'm, these. I'm still good. And it looks like Z1004 is the it's the full workplace ergonomics management program. So my mistake. Um, so so this. So the standard we're dealing with today, um, Z412-17, is going to be the specifics for what is dealt with more broadly in 1004, which is really a general outline of what a program should look like in its entirety. Perfect. And not specific to office, yeah. We just had the person send in there um, those titles as well. So <laughs> thank you to you both. All right. Do you have any thoughts on fatigue mats? Okay, I do have all kinds of thoughts on fatigue mats. Um, <laughs> so um, prolonged standing by definition is standing in one place without taking more than a couple of steps in any direction. And so uh, anti-fatigue mats are usually recommended for jobs that require prolonged standing. So as soon as a job in, uh, involves a fair amount of walking, then the need for anti-fatigue mats goes down. Um, when we are dealing with them, though, in an office environment, I am fairly skeptical because I think they can introduce um, a number of challenges in terms of either having to move it out of the way, which if you have back issues and you're standing because we don't want you sitting all day, I don't necessarily want you climbing under your desk to move a mat out of the way in order to be able to roll your chair back and forth and rolling a chair across an anti-fatigue mat compresses the mat substantially and also makes it a lot harder to roll your chair around. So as things stand right now, um, as long as your work environment, you know, is a carpeted floor, is not cold, bare concrete, um, I would generally say I would leave anti-fatigue mats out of an office environment and you really should only be standing for 20 or 30 minutes at a time anyways and then taking a break by sitting. And so that should be sufficient to provide people with um, some variability. I would save the anti-fatigue mats for the people who are standing all day. Um, you know, six or eight hours of standing are doing little or no sitting, um, and especially those who are on kind of hard, bare concrete, more of a, you know, manufacturing environment, warehouse setting sort of thing. Great, thank you. Um, so this person writes, if a person feels they need a new chair but they have a sit stand, how would you address that? Um, so th this, this sort of loops a little bit back to the, I'd like a sit stand desk, do I actually need a sit stand desk? It's the same question, right? I'd like a new chair, but do you need a new chair? So I think the, the way to go back to that is look at whether the chair that, that is there is appropriate for the individual. So one, does it fit the, the particular individual? Do they want a new chair because they're you know six foot seven and the chair isn't big enough or they're five foot two and the chair isn't small enough? Um, or do they want a new chair because they just feel like you know their chair is old and it doesn't look as nice anymore? Um, so I think it's important to figure out A, is the chair an appropriate fit? B, does the chair still work properly? Are all the functions doing what they're supposed to do? You know, does it migrate down over time? Does something fall off of it? 
Um, and if the chair either doesn't fit or doesn't function properly, then even if someone has a sit-stand desk, then there is still a requirement to provide somebody with a proper chair because the recommendation still is with a sit-stand desk that more of the day is being spent in sitting um, because you know we are recommending people not stand more, for more than four hours a day. So I think you still need to provide the chair. But sometimes people think they want a new chair because their chair isn't comfortable and it's not comfortable because it's not been adjusted properly. So often we can solve that by teaching someone to adjust a chair or maybe just playing a bit of a game of uh, musical chairs and switching their chair out with a chair that's in an empty cubicle that maybe is a better fit for them. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we just have a couple more. So this person writes, would the standing station requirements also apply to stand up forklift operators? Um, I mean, so this standard, I mean, the, the real base of it is no, because the standard is for, is for office um, and a standing up forklift, you know, that isn't going to apply. That being said, I think there are still some pieces of the research that you could apply to a standing stand up forklift operator. So obviously, a stand up forklift operator, we want to make sure has opportunities to get off the forklift and walk around because standing in one spot without the ability to walk and move does you know, result in the blood pooling in the feet. And so we would want to make sure that they're kind of getting off the forklift periodically and getting some breaks from standing. We still want them in something close to or as close as we can get to a reference posture for standing, you know, elbows under the shoulders, standing upright to make sure they're in good working postures. So the sort of general ergonomic principles are going to apply, but the standard itself, no, would not apply to them. Thank you. Okay, and our last question, and then just a reminder to anyone, if any more questions come up, you can send them to Rachel with the email on the screen, or when you see an email from me later today, you can send it to me and I will pass it along. But our last question is, do you have a sense of who or how many office furniture companies are actually following this CSA standard? This person recently was doing a renovation and was surprised at how many people were not compliant with this. Uh, I have no idea. Um, the So office furniture companies are going to be following the BIFMA standard rather than the CSA standard. Again, the, the numbers about table heights and chair heights that are in the CSA standard do come from the BIFMA anthropometric tables. Um, so they are related. So they're pulling from the BIFMA standards. So you can check when you're purchasing furniture whether that furniture is BIFMA compliant. That's going to be your best indicator of whether they're likely to be um, compliant. But I would be, again, particularly wary of sit-stand desks. And I would personally check the height ranges on any kind of sit-stand desk before you purchase it, because that's the place you are most likely to go wrong. And then the second most likely place that you're going to get into some trouble is that we have been running into a number of clients for whom the chairs don't adjust high enough. Um, so it's great that we are building chairs that go really low if you're really short, except that really short people still sit at high desks and so they still have a need in order to get a chair up nice and high um, if they don't have a keyboard tray. And so some of our chairs, we're not finding enough vertical range in them. Um, so, you know, if you're working with any of the big companies, you know, the, the globals, um, you know, they, they should be, you know, ergocentric. They're going to do a good job for the most part. Um, but you can check whether companies indicate that a product is, is, um, meets BIFMA standards, and that, that'll be your best indication. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That's the end of the questions that I've seen submitted. I Morgan, do have if I can, sorry, yes. I'm just going to jump in. If, if yes. um, anyone is sending me an email, if you can just reference this webinar in the subject line, it'll just help me sorting anything that's coming in through the, the email address, please. Yes, perfect. Um, I have up on the screen now just some upcoming OHS Insider webinars. Just as a note to anyone who is a current member, all of these are available to you through the upcoming webinars tab. And to anyone who's not a member, um, feel free to ask me about it when I email you later today and I'd be happy to get you some more info. And I have up here just my contact details. So if you have any feedback for today's webinar, if you have any questions, you can submit it there. Give me a call. I'd be happy to discuss it. And I'm always happy to take your suggestions for future webinar topics. 
So I think we're going to close out there. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think we're all sitting a little antsy in our chairs right now, ready to do some adjustments. <laughs> and I think that will be it then. Rachel, did you have any final thoughts before we close out? No, thank, thank you, everybody. And again, if you've got any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a safe day. Goodbye.